Art is a powerful tool that can spark a dialogue on political issues, especially among youth. This is especially valuable in cultural contexts where discussions on political issues and activism are considered a taboo, as the case in my country, Japan. At my university, we created an interactive art exhibition where participants were asked to write down the labels they identified themselves with, such as their gender, age, educational background, and job title, onto a post-it note, which we then stuck onto a white paper in the exhibition room. Participants shared that they could visualize the invisible labels they identified themselves with, and how these labels unconsciously hindered them from realizing their full potentials. This exhibition revealed how art can provide an acceptable way for people to consider social and political issues and spark a dialogue that can shape public opinion. Art can take many forms through which we can express our stories and ideas. So, I invite everyone to continue creating and expressing your artwork, as it has the power to change our world. I study dance and political science. People find this an odd combination, which I find odd because I see them as naturally connected. It was Alvin Ailey's piece, Revelations, that connected this for me at my first ballet school. Through gospel music and modern dance, Ailey describes the pain and joy of being a black citizen in the US. This was a turning point for my ability to connect art with social issues and politics. I recommend a universal policy that supports arts education with a civic purpose for all youth. These arts education programs would help youth develop a deeper understanding of important social and political issues that will affect their lives and engage them in expressing their viewpoints. In the long term, supporting arts education from a young age helps us develop a sense of agency to express ourselves and be more civically engaged citizens. My ability to access arts education from a young age has had one of the biggest impacts on my passion for and understanding of important social issues. It has made me who I am today. Let's do that for all young people. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this final session of the Athens Democracy Forum 2021. My name is Farah Nayeri and I'm a culture correspondent of the New York Times. I'm also the author of a book on contemporary art and activism, which is called Takedown, coming out in January in North America. Um, it's obviously a, a book that ties in quite closely with the theme we're um, tackling today, and it might be actually the reason why I'm steering this session. So I wanted to thank Kim Khan of Tabor, who's the chief programmer of this conference, for allowing me to lead this particular session. Um, since the beginning of time, artists have taken it upon themselves to challenge authority, to cry out against political excess, and to push for freedom and democracy. Some of the greatest artworks ever, just think of Goya's Disasters of War, Picasso's Guernica, are actually nothing if not pieces of protest art. And in recent decades, artists have used the media of performance art and installation art to speak truth to power, and they have actually um, sometimes paid a very high price for that. Just think of Pussy Riot in Russia, Tanya Bruguera in Cuba, and of course, Ai Weiwei in China, who is with us today um, in this panel. Uh, even in Western democracies, uh, uh, artists are making waves through protest. If you think of the artist Nan Golden, very recently, Nan, uh, who is a former addict addict to OxyContin, which is an opioid uh, marketed by the Sackler family, actually led a series of protests which actually resulted in a settlement being paid to opioid addicts. Anyway, so I, the question that I would like to kind of answer today, if we can, is, is art today still, in the 21st century, a weapon in the fight for dem democracy and political freedom? And uh, I wonder if I can actually turn as my first question to Irina Bakova, who you see on your screen. Irina is the yeah. former director general of UNESCO. Uh, Irina, I wanted to thank you very much for being with us today. It's a wonderful honor to have you in this panel. You were supposed to be here in the flesh, but unfortunately due to unforeseen circumstances, that was not possible. So it's a great pleasure to have you on screen with us. So Irina, um, United Nations and UNESCO have been working forever on the overlap between arts and culture and human rights and social justice. So, but the question I have for you is, what does art have to do with democracy? 
you say artistic expression is a fundamental democ democratic right. Why? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Irina, I'm really sorry, but Irina, I'm very sorry, but unfortunately, there seem to be te technical problems, and we are not hearing you clearly. So I think while we um, resolve those technical issues. Um, I'm going to move on to, to my next speaker and we will come back to you in the hope that these issues will be resolved. Um, my next speaker is Pavel Kunchev, who is here with me on stage. Thank you, Pavel, for, for joining us. Um, you have a nonprofit that's called Fine Acts and you create art projects that bring people together. You've produced site-specific projects on climate change and you've also created data-driven sculptures to highlight human rights abuses. Um, you say art is more effective than ever in the fight for democracy, and I wanted to know why and how art can be useful for obtaining democracy. Yeah, uh, thank you, Farah. Uh, exactly, I think that uh, we are now living in a new renaissance for arts as a tool for, to empower activism and especially to, uh, to talk about democracy and sometimes the lost values of democracy. Uh, because art is the most powerful tool that we have to engage people, to, uh, to show them why they should care about a certain aspect of the problems that we see. And, and sorry, this is one of the main problems, I think, and challenges that we uh, owe people that uh, work towards more democratic societies or trying to develop democratic societies is that people don't care usually. There is this feeling of, uh, of, of lost care about and connection to, uh, to the processes within society. So there's an apathy towards exactly. society yeah, yeah. and politics yeah. and issues and you make people care more through art? Yes, and artists are According to me and according to, to many recent uh, studies, they are one of the most powerful people that we have because of their tools, because they can bring us this uh, uh, new form of empathy. They can show us why we need to care about extremely complex problems that we usually we, we don't understand, let's be honest about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and as, as much as we want to bombard people with data, with different reports with beautiful journalistic uh, works, people need more simple uh, forms of how this data and how this truth about mm -hmm. the world that we live in are shown to them. I and understand. Art has this. Yeah, <coughs> perfect. Um, so let's go over to Wei Wei. Um, I Wei Wei, I wanted to thank you for being with us today. You are the only artist on our panel and not just any artist, I would say. Thank you. Um, your art, Weiwei, has always been uh, a blend of creativity and activism, and some of your artists, uh, excuse me, your artworks have been direct calls for freedom and democracy in China. Let's think back to uh, this diorama that you created, which represented your secret detention for 81 days in China in 2011, when you were completely cut off from the rest of the world, you were watched by guards, and you represented this detention to the slightest detail. And I, I think you know, that was a really powerful denunciation of human rights in China. But so we had an exchange before this panel and you said, art is not a weapon to be used for resistance, you said. You said art is life itself. So can I get you to just kind of elaborate on that, Weiwei? Hi. <clears throat> um, very often. Um, it's okay, the sound? The sound is okay, the image is a bit frozen, but yeah, carry on, we can hear huh. it. Okay. 
uh, very often they have uh, some kind of misunderstanding about art. Yeah. And uh, they always think, uh, yeah, it's democratic in society, or it's in some kind of crisis, we need uh, to defend the art, or defend, uh, or even promote art. I think uh, the opposite. I think uh, we only need to defend the life and uh, defend the freedom. Art is not something we need to defend. If the art doesn't function as a defending our life, it's not art. So it's not you use art as a weapon to defend the democracy or very often this has been here over and over. I think only by doing defending the values such as human rights, freedom of speech and the democracy, then you become art. Well, so I don't know. I, I mean, let, let me interrupt you here. Okay, because if I may, wait, wait. Like, if I go and do what you did, which is you in, um, what year was it? Um, in 2009, I believe at the Haus der Kunst in Munich, right? You took 9,000 backpacks and you hung them on the facade of the museum to denounce the deaths of thousands of children in the Sichuan region, uh, uh, the earthquake the year before. If I did that, like, if I really did that, first of all, they would take me to the police station. Second of all, they would say, you moron. But you did that, and everyone said, this is an important work of art. So you understand, I mean, what you're saying, you're saying art is not a weapon, but when it's coming from people like you, I think it really is a weapon, don't you? I, I'd rather not believe so. And uh, there's many people who is not being called as artists. Such, such uh, people are actually doing more powerful work than most art or art world. Right. Uh, like uh, Edward Snowden, yep. like Chelsea Manning, like uh, Julian Schnabel, or Julian uh, Assange. Mm -hmm. You know, those people are doing fantastic works which uh, protect democracy, freedom of speech, more than all whole art community together. Okay, so you're kind of minimizing the role of the artist in defending democracy, which coming from you is a bit surprising. I'll tell you why it's surprising, because you are uh, the son of one of China's great, great, greatest poets, Ai Qing. He resisted oppression in commun communist China, so you grew up as the son of someone who also resisted through poetry. And yet you're saying that art, you know, there are more important acts of resistance being done by non-artists, right? Yes. And, um, you know, China purged like millions of intellectuals. There's only a few voices come from the artists. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I am a bit surprised to see you <laughs> take this kind of a stance on, on art. But, um, but I understand. And I wondered if I could go back to Elena Bakova, uh, excuse me, Irina Bakova. I don't know if uh, we have the image of Irina, because I would like to take that message back to Irina, if, if Irina is available. But uh, Irina, can, can you hear me now? Yes, 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 I hear you, I see you. Oh, perfect. Now I can hear you better and everyone else can too. So, Irina, what do you think of what Ai Weiwei was just saying? That, you know, artists, yes, they do resistance and they, um, you know, fight for freedom, but there are far more important fights for freedom done by millions of other people. And according to Ai Weiwei, these people are actually more important than the artists. I mean, what is your thought on art and democracy, the role of the artist and freedom? Um, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear everything that uh, Y.Y. said, but uh, let me say that from the perspective of my experience with the United Nations and, of course, UNESCO, uh, which is the United Nations organization that has the responsibility uh, to promote, as is described in the Constitution, uh, the free flow of ideas by work and women. Uh, it is indeed uh, a first and foremost uh, made uh, the uh, legal framework uh, and the advocacy to work uh, with the creators uh, uh, 
helps people promote uh, these ideas. Uh, and from that point of view, I would like just to mention three main aspects. I do agree that the art and culture depends the world, uh, not only in the history of humanity, but uh, also for the, the uh, democratic, and, uh, say, uh, very inclusive of all ideas uh, all through the, the community. The first, um, and I would like to insist that um, UNESCO has worked on um, the uh, artistic freedom uh, and the uh, uh, status of the artist, uh, which is not that obvious. Um, uh, UNESCO, the major, uh, I would say, uh, convention uh, in 2005 uh, of the uh, expression of cultural diversity, the promotion of cultural diversity. Uh, and this is exactly the document uh, that uh, um, expresses very clearly that cultural development will be protected only if human rights and fundamental freedoms, such as freedom of expression, information, and communication, as well as the ability of those who have access to diverse cultural expressions, are guaranteed. Uh, yeah. I think this is very important. Unfortunately, uh, the United States is not in this convention. I think uh, uh, they may consider in the future, but it has been accepted enthusiastically by the European Union and uh, then the 130 countries uh, around the world. Yeah. And my well, last point, I mm -hmm. think uh, uh, it will be very strange if I don't mention it uh, also from my experience. Um, I would like to say that um, uh, heritage protection is one of the most democratic assets that humanity has, linking one human rights, uh, diversity, uh, and culture. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the protection of cultural. Uh, cultural heritage and cultural diversity nowadays, uh, I would say the destruction of uh, uh, heritage has always been accompanied by mass atrocities, by yes, violations yes. of human rights, yeah, 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 uh, by yeah. Right yeah. diversity. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and no, this I, I uh, is something very important. Yeah, I appreciate, yeah. absolutely. Uh, just no, to say, sorry, I need to go yeah, to move on. Because to it is linked very, just it's linked very much uh, to the title of this uh, conference, okay. uh, which yeah. is a about resilience and renewal. We can come uh, back. We can, what, uh, we can uh, come back. We can come. We come back to you. We come back to you, Rena. Um, no, I agree with the Rena of Bethany. Uh, Bethany Hughes, uh, you are a very well-known historian in uh, the United Kingdom because you're a broadcaster, and uh, television viewers uh, recognize you. Um, I think you wanted to bounce off what uh, uh, Irina Bakova was just saying. Irina made a very, very important point, which is to say the cultural heritage, especially when it is being damaged or destroyed, let's just think of Palmyra, uh, you know, it really brings home the point that culture is a basic and fundamental human right. And in that, I absolutely agree with Irina. What do you think? Well, I think very importantly, not just a human right, but a, a building block for community and society itself. And that's why actually that statement, art is life, was absolutely the right statement to make. So you agree with Ai Weiwei on that one? Oh, 100%. And I think it's very dangerous if we put artists into one box as people who can weaponize art and talk right. to democracy, because actually it is art that generates community itself. And I'd like to slightly perversely, if you're talking about the 21st century, to kind of move our timeline back 70 70,000 years. Yeah, let's so go back 70,000 years. Let's go back to kind years. of before the beginning of time <laughs> itself. Yeah. Because if we look, for instance, you know, 50,000 years ago, yeah. life is really hard 50,000 years is ago. It? Yeah. But people take time out of their really hard days to generate, for instance, a beautiful flute out of the thigh bone of a vulture so that they can play music together because that is what allows society to happen. It's something that summons other peoples to groups and allows a cohesion within a group. Right. You see it again in incredible sites like Gebepi Tepe, which are again 12,000 years old on the kind of borders of Turkey and Syria, where people are constructing vast temples not to worship gods, but to join together to have a creative and artistic experience. Yeah. And that is before people have started to build houses or settle down, you know, they're joining for art. And very, very appropriately, given that we're in Athens, you know, the birthplace of a certain form of direct democracy, when democracy is invented here, music and art is absolutely central to that experiment. So where we're sitting now, we would have been able to hear two and a half thousand years ago 
requires all <coughs> men, of course, because women were citizens, but very definitely second-class citizens. In that only, first. only male voices. Only male voices. So yeah. between 50 to 1,000 male voice choirs, which were patronised by Pericles, you know, the kind of architect of democracy, by, by this uh, man, Daimon, who he worked with, in massive concert halls. And the notion of that was that art was there to physic the soul of democracy, that, that democracy wouldn't simply not be possible if there wasn't the cohesion of art to keep people together. And I think something we should all remember is that in many civilizations through time, there has not been a separate word for art. Art has just been thought to be such a central part of existence, to eat, to drink, to breathe, to make art. And so I agree with Wei Wei. The, the idea that it's used just as a weapon of protest, you can weaponize art, but it shouldn't be used just as a weapon. It should just be used as a central part of society and you know, yeah. the, the, the delight of existence. Fantastic lead off back to, um, to, uh, to Pavel, because Pavel, yes. you, uh, your organization actually does make art for activists purposes. So what do you think of what Bethany said and Weiwei said, which is art is part of life and many civilizations didn't even have a word for it. You're making it a kind of special separate thing. And exactly. Even now, uh, art is at the forefront of, uh, of the fight for democracy because uh, the cultural aspect of, uh, of history is what we remember, what stays, and how we, and images are the things that, uh, and, and sounds and emotions are the things that we remember. And this is one of the most valuable things about art, that it inspires emotion, and it can inspire action, which is extremely important. And this is something that I and my organization work on, is how to, how to make this bridge between the arts and the people. And to add on what Ai Weiwei said, for example, he's using his platform and standing behind uh, the people on the ground, the people who are activists and who are fighting for, for certain values that, that we cherish and we also uh, believe in. Uh, so now we have artists like him and thousands and thousands, and I, I think that we are living, again, I, I'm saying this in a, in a very special time that artists know how powerful their tool set is, and uh, they can use it for, uh, for the greater good of society. Well, I don't know. I mean, Ai Weiwei seemed to minimize his tool. Let's go back to Weiwei and say, Weiwei, <laughs> what do you think of what Pavel just said, which is to say that artists are really important actors in the fight for democracy because you create works that are, speak to people, images, sculptures, installations, objects. When you make your documentary about the Syrian refugee crisis, that's a very powerful work that you made, Weiwei. Wei, and it stirred wow. people, huh? Well, when I, when I start making so-called art, very often I don't think about art. Okay. And uh, I never really think of myself as an artist, but I'd rather a human being. Okay. So I think it's a, it's a wrong concept to separate art from everyday daily life and the everyday people. Right. That would uh, make uh, art uh, some kind of elite. Yeah. But uh, rather uh, it's a wrong concept. Art is a soul of life. And uh, because we art and uh, we have a freedom. If we don't have art, we don't have a freedom. So as the lady uh, talked about uh, what happens a thousand years ago. Bethany, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the so-called uh, democracy is really a modern concept. And, uh, yeah. and uh, it's not a great concept to really uh, to make a healthy art. Rather, a lot of time is a poisoning art. So please do not mix the you know, democracy or art together. Art is freedom, and yeah. the democracy is very crippled. And uh, in many cases, many de so-called democratic, democratic society, the art comes out is very, uh, it's, it cannot even call, be called art. It's just some kind of commercial decoration. And yeah. uh, it yeah. illustrates very shallow ideas. 
Okay, but when there is no democracy, as you well know, Weiwei, and the artist is prevented from making art, then we really do feel the absence of art. So art is not just life, it is an expression. No. And when... I no? don't think so. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the great art come from, uh, you know, even in Soviet Union, in yeah. China, in more difficult uh, time, in, yeah. in time have uh, slaves or even, you know, we have a great art come from history. There's nothing about the democracy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're here at the Athens Democracy Forum, but whatever you say, Weiwei. <laughs> um, let's go back to Irina for just a, a minute or two minutes, because afterwards I'm going to um, open this up to questions, which we may be receiving um, on the iPad or from the room. Um, Irina, what, what are your thoughts about what we just heard from, from Weiwei and Bethany? Um, and also Pavel really saying art is basically life, that we don't need to protect it or make a big deal out of it. Well, uh, if uh, you allow me, I don't think that we will have anything about that. Yeah, I'm, hello? I live uh, uh, at your big uh, and I would say large it. Uh, we understand our identities uh, and also about, uh, nowadays activity it's about the thing. Yeah. I would say largely uh, it's about yeah, unfortunately, um, Irina, uh, sorry, unfortunately, the, 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 we're having technical problems again hearing you. I'm really very sorry about that. So let's, let's jump over to Bethany. Well, yeah, well, just to chip in, just to say, I, I wouldn't want to say that we don't need to protect art. We absolutely need to protect art. And right. again, what you see in dysfunctioning societies right through time, and this goes back to evidence from the Bible, from Genesis and Deuteronomy and the books of Isaiah and the Rig Veda uh, in the Indian subcontinent and the Epic of Gilgamesh in the Middle East, is that we hear that art is destroyed as collateral damage when the morality and spirit of a community needs to be destroyed. One of the first things that people have done through time is to destroy art, and that's something that we still see around us today. So I think we absolutely need to protect art because the very fact that it's a target shows it that this is where there's a repository of shared experience and cultural identity and cultural memory and ideas. So no, I mean, I would be the first to die to save art. But I think, as, as yeah. Weiwei says, you know, we, we do ourselves a disservice when we talk yeah. about it as something which is distinct from society. It's a bit like oxygen and water. I think Weiwei in an email with me earlier was saying art is like air or water. Mm. Uh, when air is around, water is around, we take it for granted. But when it's taken away, I guess then we really seriously feel its absence, right? Mm. Uh, yeah, completely. Yeah. Yeah. And as I said, it's been continuous. The, the destruction of art is not something of contemporary warfare. That has been absolutely continuous throughout the story of time because it's an incredibly easy target and a, the most brilliant target for an adversary because it destroys so much in a single action. Mm -hmm. Let's go over to Pavel, because we have actually a question yeah. from the audience. Okay. It would be important yeah. for us to bring in our audience, who we thank very much for watching this. Um, it says you've created activist artwork, and uh, it's from a student delegate, and you have co-founded co the largest online volunteering services in Bulgaria. Do you see a link between your activist artwork and your, I guess, civic volunteering work? Well, I think that artists are activists and maybe uh, I don't 100% share uh, Ai Weiwei's view that uh, that art is impartial and living is creating art and vice versa. I think that art stands for, uh, for values. So it's important what values the artists stand for. So uh, coming back to to what Bethany said, there are also some examples of, uh, of destruction of art, like uh, last year's uh, destruction of a statue in Bristol in the United Kingdom yep. of Colston, so who was a slave trader, the biggest yep. in the area. So sometimes it's, uh, it's a participatory 
phenomenon in which uh, art is uh, a communal project, which comes back to to activism and, and volunteers and, and, city, and yeah. citizen engagement. Let me go, uh, go to Weiwei on that one. Weiwei, um, is it true that all art is activism? I mean, what, what, what's your... Uh, What's your position on that well, one? Well, I, I said very clear. If, 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 if artist is not an activist, it's a dead artist. OK. But what about if an artist? <laughs> right. But what we have about four minutes left. Um, what about if an artist is like, what if, what if I'm a painter sitting in my studio, all on my, isolated in some corner somewhere, you know, wherever, and I never see anyone, and I'm just painting on a canvas, and I'm painting a landscape? How is that activism? Well, the art, artists uh, have to find their own language. And uh, to communicate well is part of their activism. If I see. they cannot achieve it, they are half dead. Yeah, so art has to communicate with the public. And would you say that all art is political? Would you go that far? I think uh, all art is political. Even the art demand itself is not political, it's even more political. Right, gosh. <laughs> All right, Bethany, what do you think of that? Yeah, well, I'm just, I'm also just thinking what our definition of art is. Maybe slightly, yeah. you know, late, kind of two minutes to go. But yeah. we're not just talking about visual art, obviously. We're talking about music and poetry yes, and, yes, and storytelling. Yeah. And just, you know, very interesting to hear that because we now know that neuroscientifically, we, at, when we create art, as in when we create stories, and we, when we create stories about ourselves, our memories of ourselves are a storybook version of what we want to remember we are. If you, if you, you know, so our memories, our individual memories, are constructed by us as stories. Mm -hmm. So it is completely vital to notice who is telling whose story and yeah. which story is dominant in the narrative. So I think, just to say that point about all artists are activists, we, we are all active artists in the, in the, fa in the, uh, the sharing of the stories that yeah. we choose to communicate. So, it's just to, you know, to widen it out that it's not, just, it's not just somebody doing a watercolour, it's our communication of our imagination of the world that we live in. And that why is why it's the most, has the most extraordinary potential for harmony. I just like to be a bit more kind of upbeat. We're talking about, you know, what is the point of art? Can it be used in, in the democratic process? Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a beautiful um, origin of the word harmony. So, Harmony in ancient Greek originally meant a join. It was a, a place where things could join, which is why our arms are called arms, because they're a thing joined to our shoulders. Right. And the point of harmony in ancient Greek society, and actually at the time of Confucius as well, was that it was the joining not of the same things, but of the difference. So harmony in old Chinese, yeah. the, the visual representation of that is a bowl in which water and wine can yeah. be mixed. Mm -hmm. So the different can be mixed. So yeah. that's just, just to kind of throw a bit of positivity out no, there, because I mean, this is the final you section. You know, it's not negative to say that all art is political, but mm. I do, we only have about a minute, so Weiwei, if you don't mind, I want to come back to you and give you the last word in this panel. Um, all art is political. Um, yeah, I mean, explain why. I mean, how is a watercolor political? I mean, I just, you know, I'm just throwing that out there. You give a big topic for one, one yeah, sentence. Yeah, for one minute, yeah. We are, sorry. We are living in yeah. human society, and the human society is a political, um, is political condition. You yeah. know, we are no longer living individually. Yeah. We are all part of some kind of value and some kind of principles. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't matter where you live. You belong to a set of our principles and values. Yep, absolutely. And that is the definition of, I guess, with society comes politics, right? Yeah. Yes, the language, you know, the language you communicate is a purely political language. Yeah, absolutely. Well, th thank you so much, uh, Weiwei, and thank you very much to my four panelists for a riveting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
introduce a video uh, from the International Youth Think Tank. Thank you. Still we swear